I should start singing De Vieni alla <laughs> Finestra. Avi Avital, that is oh, one of the most famous licks, as it were, for mandolin in all of classical music. It is the beginning of the serenade of Don Giovanni De Vieni alla Finestra. Exactly, yes. But you're taking the mandolin out of the orchestra pit and in front of the orchestra. A yeah. crusader for the mandolin. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> when did this bug bite you? Oh, um, several um, stations in my life, several times uh, in my life. But I think the most uh, formative uh, moment was when I was just finishing my music academy um, in Jerusalem. And uh, for very, very funny reasons, I never had a mandolin teacher. Uh, I was always studying with a violin teacher, simply because there wasn't any mandolin teacher at the music academy. So I played all the violin repertoire on the mandolin. <laughs> well, uh, that's why you play the Four Seasons as part exactly. of your repertoire, right? For example, yeah. I still do yeah. um, a lot, but uh, I started, I was 20, 23 years old. I just graduated from the music academy in Jerusalem. I started to win competitions, I started to um, um, to get some concerts also outside of Israel and I thought to myself, wait a second, if I want to call myself a mandolin player, I can go on and just playing violin music or do Don Giovanni for the rest of my life, although I love that. It's it's a great star turn. It's the best opera of yeah. Mozart, it's the best part. Sure. In a, <laughs> <laughs> don't mind me saying, totally objective. and. Um, and so I started to, to think, what do I, uh, what do I consider uh, a bright future for the instrument and also for myself uh, um, as a mandolin, as a professional uh, uh, mandolin player. And I started to, and that led me to, uh, to be very creative uh, about what I do and to start also commissioning pieces for the mandolin, like the concerto. That we'll have on these concerts, one. exactly. Yeah. And really, with th th that gave me the whole, uh, drive to, to really present the mandolin uh, on mainstream um, stages as, as an instrument, front row, like all the other instruments. That we well, have. it's fascinating because, of course, in American popular culture, mm. the mandolin has never suffered. Uh, pop groups like Mumford and Sons, although it's an English group, yeah. but, and uh, the new host of Prairie Home Companion is Chris, Chris Thiele, who's a great mandolin player. And yeah. The mandolin is not uh, an unloved instrument, except in the concert hall. And there really is, if I remember right, only one really famous early concerto for mandolin, the Vivaldi. And exactly. you'll play it on these concerts. That we will play, yeah. <laughs> sort of a, an introductory, for, in other words, uh, if you've never heard the mandolin in front of an orchestra before, this is what it sounds like. Exactly. This is yeah. the Old Testament of the mandolin <laughs> repertoire. Uh, and Vivaldi, it's funny because Vivaldi is, um, 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 is connected to the mandolin, is, is often associated with the mandolin because of that concerto and another concerto for two mandolins. Those right. are the two Concerti that Vivaldi wrote for the mandolin, and that's why people associate Vivaldi with the mandolin. Sure. Just to compare for the bassoon, he wrote 37 concerti. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, these two concerti were really two above the average at that yeah. time for this caliber of a composer. Uh, and therefore, we all, we mandolin players around the world are grateful for uh, Vivaldi to have written this sweet uh, uh, two concerti. Why are you so passionate about this instrument? What what mm. makes it so special for you? You could have played violin, cello, trumpet, yeah. anything. Why did you gravitate? Well, for one thing, it's it's the fact that it's still to be discovered mm. uh, uh, by the audience and and by myself. You know, when I commission a piece and uh, I get the score for the first time, I put it on my uh, music stand and I start reading it. Often I would go like, "Oh, you can't play that. I have to call the composer." I mean, how can you? What, what did you mean? <laughs> uh, but if I gave it uh, you know, 15 minutes, I would say like, oh, okay, this is a new thing. Uh, that happened very often to me. Mm -hmm. Also with the, with the Dorman Concerto, by the way, because it, when he gave me the score, it's like, I can't play this, it's too difficult. <laughs> but then you know, I developed the technique uh, to, uh, to play it, and now, of course, it's part of the uh, core repertoire. For another thing, it's the fact that um, I walk on stage knowing that 80%, 90% of the audience, for them it's the first time they're going to hear mandolin uh, live, at least in this context. Uh, and this is great energy to work with. It's really great and I don't think there are a lot of violin or pianists uh, that, that can say so. 
The Vivaldi Concerto and the general image of the mandolin is, for lack of a better cliche, sunshine. Yeah. The Avner Dorman <laughs> piece is not all sunshine. That's true. It is a darker work. It's a work that explores some of the deeper emotions, which again is new territory for the stereotype of the mandolin. Exactly. Did you two work on this particular idea of making a piece that is a little more, uh, has more emotion in it? Yeah, a lot, of mm. course. Uh, if, in different aspects, Avner Dorman is one of these composers who I like to work with because I felt that this is a tailor-made mm. uh, piece. So I came to him and I said, I said, the mandolin needs the concerto de Aranjuez. Uh, uh, the equivalent and, uh, of the Rodrigo that every guitarist it, plays. Exactly. Right. Something that would be monumental and would, uh, would reflect the new um, uh, mandolin, the redefined uh, uh, mandolin, and also that would echo everything that I have to say. So he knows me very well, and we spent hours on Skype improvising and testing things. Uh, and also one thing that I, that I asked him uh, right at the beginning is what does the mandolin say to you? When I say mandolin, what do you think of? And he says Italian film music, right. uh, Middle Eastern sound, um, bluegrass, Choro uh, from Brazil, you know, all, all these all the associations right. uh, that, that he amazingly put inside his concerto. And if you go through the uh, to the different sections, I could really trace what what was his what he was thinking mm. at every moment of the of the piece and where did he get the inspiration or the imagination uh, for that section. So it really combines everything that the mandolin said to him in his imagination, um, and also I feel it's very fitted uh, to me as a performer. It's very fitted to the to the way I see the new mandolin, the concert hall. Uh, mandolin. You're a citizen of the world, you travel all over, you're with us this weekend, you're playing a recital at Athens on Sunday afternoon, which I'm sure a lot of our audience will want to go to as well as hearing you with the orchestra this weekend. You live in Berlin, but your mandolin and you are from Israel. Yeah. Why was the mandolin <laughs> made in Israel? It's another interesting uh, story because, um, as I mentioned before, I studied uh, in Israel always with violin teachers, mm. just because, again, there was no mandolin teacher and that's how it worked. And it seemed, seemed normal to me as a mm. kid that <laughs> my teacher would sit with the violin and I with the mandolin would <laughs> play sonatas and partitas as well. Completely normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but because I had to deal with all this uh, violin repertoire, the traditional mandolin was just not enough for it. There weren't enough tones, it, it's small, it's a little bit um, Limited. You, you can't feel, yeah, exactly. You cannot yeah. uh, feel the sound in a concert hall of 2,000 or 3,000 uh, people um, with it. So there was the need for a new instrument, new mandolin that would be fitted for a modern concert hall for such a demanding repertoire, like the, the you know, Rondo Capriccioso by uh, uh, Saint Sans and so on. So, really demanding virtuosic uh, violin repertoire. And luckily, uh, there was this um, artist, uh, uh, genius luthier in Tel Aviv, Ari Kerman, that, uh, that was also in, driven by that. He wanted to build mandolins like never before. He wanted to build an, an instrument that would be fitted, that would be loud, that would be considered um, uh, as, um, as the other uh, instruments. He, he chose the best um, uh, wood. Mm -hmm. uh, from the wood dealer, he never told them, by the way, that he's building mandolins with it. He was like, he's saying, no, I'm building violins with him. So they wouldn't <laughs> give him the cheap food, uh, <laughs> but really select a good one for him. So he didn't, um, uh, yeah, so he, he just developed this uh, mandolin, which, uh, uh, which is it's flat back a little bit like the American mm -hmm. mandolin, but has uh, two soundboards, for example, and all kind of inventions that make it uh, a concert mandolin. Exactly. So we may be looking at a Stradivarius of our own time sooner uh, yeah. or later. From Cremona <laughs> to Tel Aviv, exactly. not a bad journey. Would you uh, finish off our little time together with a small serenade? Sure. Thank you. Well, this is, I'll play a little bit of the uh, mandolin concerto that we're going to play, uh, just the tutti of the beginning, uh, that we're going to play uh, together with the orchestra. The interesting thing about this uh, mandolin concerto by Vivaldi 
uh, is that Vivaldi indicates the entire orchestra to play pizzicato throughout the concerto. Uh, for his time, it's really it's avant-garde. Yeah, you know, and the whole orchestra playing only pizzicato, the three movements, and uh, and that was Vivaldi's way to kind of bow to the mandolin, like the, the entire orchestra is paying homage to exactly this beautiful Be becoming a, a mandolin orchestra to support it. So it's go like this. Thank you, Avi. <laughs> Thank you very much.